landscape photographs. Then may I offer a few suggestions. Try this, but first, a few things not to do. And that is to assume that the most expensive camera are going to make your landscape pictures any better. They won't. Of course, you need a quality camera, perhaps one you are used to using. So don't change the camera either. Or indeed the lens, uh, assuming again that the best quality lens is going to improve your landscape pictures. It might help, but it won't be what you are looking for. And furthermore, you might have technique oozing from your fingertips and elsewhere. Even with that knowledge, you need something extra in order to get successful landscape photographs. And that is what I'm going to show you now. Any quality camera, irrespective of make, we fine. I use Olympus. Why? Because I like them. And you'll get similar results if you use Canon, Nikon. If you can get on with those cameras, then don't change. Furthermore, I do most of my shoots with just one lens, a zoom. Those of you who know about the Olympus lens system, I'm using the 12 to 100 Pro lens for most of the time. If I now convert those focal lengths into full frame or film format for the benefit of those photographers, then we're talking of wide angle from 24 through to 200. That is quite sufficient. It's an eight and a half times optical zoom. I don't really need anything more, particularly if I'm going on a long walk over mountain and moorland. Keep it simple, like me. Landscape photography is often mistakenly assumed to be easy. It's a static subject. It's, it's just sitting out there waiting for you to come along. Skippity hop, boom, got a picture. No, sorry, it doesn't quite work like that. First of all, before you leave home, do your research. Now, I use Ordnance Survey Maps. I, I think they are the best in the world. They show incredible detail. Now, I'm not planning to go to Mansfield for the moment. I'm showing you this one because it's got one of my photographs on the front cover. Also, as well as consulting maps, guidebooks. Yes, you've guessed it, there's my pictures in here of the Isle of Wight. But very often a landscape, its geology, geography, history, shapes that landscape, gives you the reason for taking it in the first place. And to have some idea what went on, perhaps the Romans passed by or something like that, does help to give the third dimension to our images. So, research. And I enjoy it at home. I think it's half the fun, quite honestly. By all means, use a car to get to a location. But once there, ditch it and go for a walk. Some of my best images, like this one on the screen now, is taken miles away from a road. This, incidentally, is the summit of Sergeant Man, a fell in the Lake District. Another advantage of not using a car, yes, I go by public transport, either bus or train. If you have a car, then you are confined to a circular walk, covering not so much variety in terrain. If, first of all, you study the bus times, the places where they stop, or the trains, then quite often you can do a linear walk covering much more different ground of variety. And of course, if like me, you are the proud owner of a bus pass, you can do that for free. Or if you have a rail card, then I get a third of the prices. And as many of you know already, when I go to the location, I go on an advance first class ticket 
and have breakfast on the way there, in the train, and dinner with wine on the way back. What more do you want? Be in the right place at the right time. And of course, a camera is not going to help you here. Here you must have a certain amount of understanding of weather patterns courtesy of the weather forecast, which of course you can watch on BBC and maybe other channels as well. If we take this shot taken in Scotland at Locative, it was a showery day, therefore rainbows are going to be more common. Also the sun is fairly low in the sky, so you get that greater arc of the rainbow that makes it so attractive. So this is a yes, yes, I, I do need to have an understanding of photography in the first place. But what really makes this picture is an understanding and knowledge of the weather. And you're probably saying to me, ha ha ha, did he get wet? No, sorry, I was on a coach with a party of photographers and they were quite pleased with this and of course the coach is just behind me. The landscape photographer, particularly in the professional field, all right, you are perhaps an amateur in many ways, you can do what you like. But for me, for my clients, I have to be capable of taking landscape pictures at any time of day, not just the two ends, that's become a cliché. You must be able to take decent pictures throughout the day in all weathers. So just to be, I hope, a little different, here's a shot at bottom key taken into the light. And of course here is where the technique of photography becomes important, much more important, in order to avoid flare. So I stop down to f16, yes, which I know you're not supposed to do, it causes diffraction, but then I consider flare to be a greater danger. And I think the picture has uh, worked quite well. Of course, the, the weather doesn't always do the right thing for you or what you have hoped for. As a matter of interest, this picture was taken an hour or so after the last one. And look how much the weather has changed. This great big heavy cloud came over, but I found the right foreground of this dead tree to complement, I think, the bad weather. Now, again, did the poor chap get wet? Yes, he did. There's no car or coach or train to save me. You just get soaking wet. Be prepared to suffer for your art and not complain. It's all part of the story, the act. Just go out and enjoy it and get soaking wet. Yes, despite what I say, don't believe what he says, by the way, I do take pictures of both ends of the day, dawn and sunset, but I don't go to bed in the middle. I carry on taking photographs. But I've put this shot in to talk about the third dimension, to give depth to a two-dimensional presentation. The rock in the foreground, of course, is important, but really what gives the third dimension to this picture, of course, is the light coming towards the camera. Again, in order to avoid unwanted flare, I stop down to f16 or 22, risking diffraction. Yes, I do everything wrong, but I get the pictures which I can sell to my publishers. And that's really, at the end of the day, what matters for me. Another little compositional tip that you might find useful is to try and frame the picture and have a composition on the diagonal. And you've got that both in this shot of the City of London 
taken from Tower Bridge. Also, I might add, given the state of Tower Bridge, that it is a busy place, this is not a place to put up a tripod. Therefore, I hope the image is sharp, because what I've done is to rely on the image stabilizers in both camera and lens. And really, I think it does a fine job, even when you're down to a fifteenth or an eighth of a second, even longer shutter speeds. You can get away with murder, can't you? I'm coming back to shooting into the light, converger, to use the posh expression. Now here I do everything wrong, things you're not supposed to do by the soothsayers in photography. And do you know what they did with soothsayers in medieval times when they got it wrong? Yes, they burnt them at the stake. Perhaps I shouldn't wish that on people who give me photographic advice, which I totally ignore. Shooting into the light like this, you've got a high risk of flare. In many ways, the type of lens I'm using, I assume, is not the best. This type of shot is better accomplished with a prime lens. But, furthermore, I stop down maybe to 16 f22, you know, the factor numbers you're not supposed to use for quality work. The reason for this is that I'm trying to reduce flare, which would be worse than diffraction. And the other thing you might find happens with shots similar to this, and I've largely avoided, that when you have the sun in the picture, then if you don't stop down, then the sun, the burnout from the sun, spreads out further than the circle, the oval of the sun. So there's many reasons which, of course, we're not supposed to do. Naughty, naughty, naughty. But stop down to f16 or 22, and you can still get, I think, a decent photograph. I hope in this program I've given one or two tips about landscape photography that you will find useful. One other thing, important thing, I would add, try and wean yourself off the automation of your camera. Take full control of it. Furthermore, travel light. You don't need a load of gear. I just use a camera with one lens, the one I've mentioned already, to 12 to 100. I don't even take a tripod. Why not? Well, there's so much light out of doors that a reasonably fit person should be able to hand hold a camera without an image stabiliser. I, of course, have image stabilisers in both camera and lens, so that, for me, is going to guarantee sharp pictures, even with a wide depth of field, where I need to use a smallish aperture. Don't listen to the soothsayers. Maybe not me, incidentally, because they can get it wrong. Try not to be a real photographer. You'll find the queue too long. Instead of being a clone of somebody else, be your own photographer. Don't be a photographer like me. That will spell disaster. But if I've mentioned one or two things that you think, yeah, that's right, then embody it into your own working practice and be your own master. And then, I hope, you'll get some wonderful some marvellous landscape pictures. Dare I say, if nothing else works, I do one-to-one -one photo tuition. Go to my website, www.derrickforce.com, look under tuition, and maybe one day I might have the pleasure of meeting some of you. Thank you very much for looking at this programme. See you again another day.